Hello. To all of my nursing students, all of my pharmacology lovers, welcome. Welcome to Miss Williams Pharmacology Chapter 8. Okay, now we're just going to say welcome to Chapter 8. And let me tell you what we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss some anti-tuberculosis um, medications. They're called some anti-tubercular medications and some antifungal medications, okay? We're going to really work through this. This one right here is, you know, not as uh, involved, but I need you to pay close attention, all right? So, let's start. So, let's first start off by talking about what is tuberculosis, all right? So, tuberculosis is a highly communicable disease. It is caused by microbacterium tuberculosis, and TB is spread by aerosol transmissions, which transfer bacteria-filled droplets through the air when the person with active TB laughs, coughs, sneezes, sings, whistles, anything that you're, okay, anything that's going, Okay, that's how the droplets get out. Okay, when inhaled, the bacteria multiply freely when they reach a susceptible site in the lungs, like the bronchi and the alveoli, and form a primary TB lesion, which is a small inflamed pocket of bacteria and the white blood cells and exudate will increase and follow. The lesions is surrounded by more white blood cells that cause a response known as pneumitis. During the time, many people who have an intact immune system develop immunity to the TB organism, and further growth of bacteria is controlled by confining it to the primary lesions. They usually resolve, leaving little or no residual bacteria, and they may show on a chest x-ray as a scar. The immune response develops between two and 10 weeks after the first infection with a TB organism and can be detected by positive reactions to an intradermal TB skin test. A skin test is positive when a reddened area of 10 millimeters or more um, that is much harder than the surrounding area of soft tissue, which we call induration, forms around the injection site. So let me explain that just a little bit. You know how when you go get a TB test done, right? And then they put the um, medication just a little bit under the skin right? And then it gets that little bubble. Um, what they're going to wait for when they come back to read it is if it has grown, if it is reddened, or if it has a different textile feel from the surrounding skin. Now, I put a little um, form on here so that you guys can see how the TB infection um, moves and what all of the partials are. Now, um, once TB is in the blood, it can spread throughout the body and it can damage many organs. It is when it starts spreading really badly, a disorder that is known as the mil uh, Millery TB. Now, a person infected with TB that is progressing beyond the initial stage cannot spread the disease to others until they have some active symptoms. Active TB is diagnosed by a chest x-ray, uh, blood assay to test for the TB organism, and a sputum culture will be done. Now, let's talk about some types of medications or drugs for tuberculosis. Now, even with initial improvement, drug therapy must continue for at least six months to control the disease because TB organisms are a very slow growing. Many common antibacterial drugs are not effective in controlling or killing it. 
There are variations of these first-line drugs along with other drug types that are used when the patient either does not tolerate the standard first-line therapy or is infected with TB that is drug resistant. The risk for TB transmission is reduced after an infectious person has received the first line anti-TB drug therapy for two to three weeks and the clinical improvement occurs. Current first line therapies for TB um, <clears throat> includes isonides, Rafamins, Pramazides, and Ethomibutol in different combinations and in different schedules. To control TB, this depends on the strict adherence to the drug therapy that the client is. Now let's talk about how these medications work. Now, when you have a uh, back, uh, back Bacterial sites versus bacterial statics for treating these meds. Bacterial sites will kill the bacteria and bacterial statics only suppress bacterial growth. Remember that because you need your immune system to work for bacterial statics. Remember we spoke about that a little bit earlier. It's depending on the drug concentration within an infected site and the susceptibility of the organism. Iozides, okay, Iozides, these works by inhibiting several enzymes that are important to um, mycobacterial metabolism and reproduction. It is able to inhibit these enzymes even when TB is dormant, which means in the active state. Most often, it is given as an oral drug but can be given as an IV or an IM injection as well. Then we have rifepin, okay? These prevent productions of the TB organisms by binding the enzyme that allows the RNA to be transcribed from the DNA. Without this particular enzyme, the TB cannot make the protein that it needs to reproduce. Then we have primazymes. This has an unknown mechanism of an action that does reduce the pH of the intracellular fluid of white blood cells in which the TB um, baculus would live. All right. The lower pH inhibits the TB from reproducing. It is most effective in the early stages of the TB disease. Then we have ethambutol. Now this suppresses the reproduction of TB bacteria by an unknown mechanism. Again, it is only bacteriostatic and must be used in combination with any other TB drug. Now, there is a new TB drug that is called Sertruro, and this is a combination of a couple of medications that is approved to use with four standard lines of anti-tuberculosis drugs. When the drug, um, when the disease has some uh, degree of resistance um, to INH and RIF, that we want to use the, the Saturo. Now let's talk about what are some of the intended effects of what we want to happen. And then what are some of the side effects of what could happen when you're taking these particular medications. The intended response is for the coughing to be reduced and for sputum also um, production to be reduced. We want the fatigue of the client to be reduced. We want them to not lose any weight. We want them to have some weight gain. And the sputum culture, we want it to be negative, okay, uh, of TB organisms. 
some of the side effects that we may be looking for um, to monitor for the patient when they are on these medications. Some of the common ones are things like diarrhea, headache, nausea, vomiting, and difficulty sleeping. When you have a patient who is on um, Rifepin, now this particular side effects of this medication are things like abdominal pain and urinary retention. They could have drug st uh, stained skin, uh, uh, staining their urine, staining their tears, and other secretions will be stained. And the staining looks like reddish orange coloring. Some additional side effects from the pyrimazine. This includes things like muscle aches and pains. They could get acne and an increased sensitivity to sun or um, ultraviolet lights. Also, with that medication and ethambutol, they could have increased formation of uric acid which can cause them to have some signs and symptoms of gout or make gout worse if they already are diagnosed with gout. Some of the adverse effects of these particular medications are things like liver toxicity. This risk is greatly increased if the patient drinks alcoholic beverages or uses acetaminophen while taking these medications. Some potentials for many interactions are also noted when um, taking these medications. Now, the potentials for many interactions with isonides can have some peripheral neuropathy, which is a loss of sensation, especially in their hands and in their feet. And this occurs most often in a malnourished patient and those who also have diabetes or patients who are battling with alcoholism. Rifepin can cause anemia as the adverse effect. Ethobutol can cause optic neuritis, vision changes that cause um, some red um, or some coloring of the vision to be reduced. They may have blurred vision they may have a reduced visual feel. This problem can lead to the patient becoming blind. When the problem is discovered early, the eye problems are usually reversible just because you stopped the medication. So please make note of that. So there are a few things that we're gonna to want to do before um, taking this medication. So before taking this medication, we want to check the patient's most recent um, lab values for evidence of liver problems like an increase in liver enzymes. These drugs can cause liver toxicity, so we want to make sure that their liver enzymes are not already elevated before taking it. They should not be given to patients who already have liver problems. We're going to ask the male patients whether they have an enlarged prostate. We're going to ask all the patients if they have any problems that cause some urine retention. Um, we're going to report that to the prescriber before giving the medication. We're going to check the patient's most recent lab values to see if they're already having some anemia because as we discussed, there's a couple of those meds that will make anemic um, presentation worse. So we need to know what is their blood count, the low red blood cell count, or a low hemoglobin level. Patients with a history of gout, if they're taking that primazine or ethobutol, we're gonna encourage the patient to drink a full glass of water with the drug and drink at least 3,000 mLs of water every day. Patients who have memory or compliance problems or who are homeless, maybe, may benefit from direct observed therapy, which is called DOT, all right, D-O-T, in which the nurse or other healthcare providers watches the patient take their medication. This practice contributes uh, and continues to be more successful of complete treatment 
fewer relapses and the uh, decrease in drug resistance. Now, after taking these medications, um, the IV drug forms, we're going to check the patient's vital signs and the respiratory status at least every 15 minutes for the first hour or so. We're going to tell the patients to immediately report any shortness of breath or changing in breathing. We're going to um, check the patient for any jaundice, that is yellowing of the skin or the sclera, uh, which is a symptom that's showing us that there's some kind of liver deficiency and problem. The best place to check are the whites of somebody's eyes close to the iris, the roof of their mouth, and their chest for any jaundice. If the patient is diabetic, we're going to check their blood glucose levels for, uh, more frequently and assess fasting blood glucose levels and levels of their hemoglobin A1C whenever they are ordered. So we need to make sure that the patient is maintaining their appointments and keeping with orders. We're gonna report any higher than normal um, blood uh, levels to the prescriber for adjustments in the dosages for some anti-diabetic drugs. At each visit, we're gonna ask the patient about numbness, tingling, or any pain in their hands or in their feet for some neuropathy going on. We're going to use monofilaments to check for the patient's peripheral neuropathy. We also, after giving these medications, we're going to check their INO. If the patient's urine output is 1,000 mLs less than he or she is drinking, or if some other symptoms of urinary retention are noted, are present like a enlarged bladder, like a lower abdominal pain, we're going to notify the provider right away. We're going to urge the patient to drink plenty of water throughout the day and night after they are receiving the medications and ask about any pain in their joints or swelling in their joints, especially around the big toe, the foot, the ankle, because then that will signal what signs and symptoms of some gout. And we're going to check for swelling. Now, here are some of the teaching points when giving these particular meds. We want to teach the patient to keep a supply of the medication that is prescribed on hand at all times. We want to remind them that this disease is usually no longer contagious after drugs have been taken for two to three consecutive weeks. That means no pauses, no I forgot my meds, that kind of stuff. Two to three consecutive weeks, they are no longer contagious. And when we note clinical improvement is seen also will signal improvement. We're going to stress that the patient must continue to take the meds or the drugs for up to six months or longer, um, depending on what is prescribed, but they need to take it exactly as it is prescribed. We want to teach them to avoid alcohol and acetaminophen during the entire therapy because we know that when you are doing that, you are increasing the risk of liver toxicity. And it's already going to tax their liver. So we need to be very, very careful. A patient that is under the influence of alcohol may also be less likely to remember to take their drugs as prescribed. We're going to notify, uh, educate them to notify the prescriber if they notice any yellowing of their skin or their eyes or any dark urine or light stools, because that would also state that they may have some liver toxicity. We're going to tell the patients that TB drugs may cause them some nausea. So to help to prevent that, we're going to suggest that they take their uh, daily dose at bedtime. If the diabetic checks their blood glucose levels as often as prescribed, we need to notify the prescriber if their level is out of target range. So we need to educate the client on what their target range is, like just refresh them on that, and then teach them if it's outside of that, they need to let their prescriber know. And any adjustments to anti-diabetic drug dosages or schedule of the drug type may be needed. We're going to also teach them that if they are taking uh, eyes, eyes and eyes, this can raise their blood pressure to a dangerous level. 
when they are also taking things like too much caffeine. So like coffee and tea or chocolate and sodas, you know, things with caffeine in it. If they're taking rifampin, this drug can stain their urine, their skin, and other secretions. So we need to educate them on that so that that doesn't freak them out. If you end up with something, you know, reddish orange staining from your face, from your tears and stuff like that, you would want to have a heads up on what's going on with that. Um, and that it will resolve within a few weeks after they stop the drug, but that that is what's going to happen. That's what that is. And that soft contact lenses will be permanently stained um, if they are on that medication. We want to educate them to drink at least eight ounces of water when taking the drug and then increase the intake to at least three liters of water every day. Um, drink throughout the day and at least one glass of water during the night. We want to teach them to wear um, protective clothing, a hat, sunscreen, anything like that to protect their skin when they're going outside in the sunlight. If they're taking at the uh, at the butyl, we want to educate them to notify their prescriber immediately if any changes in the vision is noted and they should always follow up with an ophthalmologist. We're going to warn the patients to tell us all of their health care providers that um, and to tell everybody who's taking care of them that they are taking their first line drugs of TB because of potential drug uh, interaction. So if they are educating all of their caregivers on what they're taking, then we can decrease any by chance drug interactions. Now the lifespan considerations are these. For pediatric patients, infants and children of any age who have active TB should take the first line anti-TB drugs with the exception of ethambutol okay the dosages are the same for larger adolescents and children as adults all right for pregnancy and lactating women the consideration is that they are approved for treatment of active TB we must though closely monitor the liver function while they're pregnant and after also, that the first line of active TB drugs appear in their breast milk. So when possible, breastfeeding should be avoided. And our lifespan considerations for the older adult is that they're already at risk for liver toxicity. So it's just going to make their risk higher. Older adults may have some degree of a cataract formation in one or both eyes. So this condition makes visual assessment of the optic neuritis even more difficult. Now let's move on and talk about fungal infections. So we're going to start off by saying what is a fungal infection, right? So a fungal infection is a simple organism with one or more cells such as yeast, mold, uh, and mushrooms that produced um, are produced by spores and it has cells that are walled and can either live peacefully with humans or infect humans <laughs> and cause diseases. Fungi live in places that are normally moist and dark. There are more than a hundred thousand different types of fungi. Some are very harmless and not completely removed by using things like bathing um, and without treatment, fungal infections remain and can become widespread, especially in people who have some immune systems um, that are impaired or are not as healthy. Superficial fungal infections are uncomfortable and change the appearance of functions of the infected skin area when they either enter to the body by inhalation or through a break in the skin deep fungal infections can result 
With deep fungal infections, the function in the affected organ can be reduced. The organ can also be destroyed. I have a slide that shows you the site of what it looks like for an anti, um, anti fungal drug activities. Now let's go ahead and talk about um, anti-fungal drug, anti drugs. Now the drugs for the superficial, now y'all know superficial means just right on top, right? Just do to do. Superficial drug infections, these involve topical applications of antifungal drugs. And the same type of drugs can also be used for deeper fungal infections, but are uh, prepared as creams, lotions, ointments, shampoos, powders, oral lozenges, and vaginal suppositories as well. The topical drugs are successful at clearing up fungal infections that are not severe in patients with healthy immune systems. And exceptions in uh, fungal infections of fingernails or toenails. Please make sure that you refer to the box that states patient teaching tips for topical antifungal agents. It tells you what to teach the patient on, how to put it on. Please make note of that. Drugs for deep or systemic fungal infections. When the fungal infections are deep or if they are invasive, systemic drugs are needed to kill the fungus like fungicidal actions, or slow their production, which are fungal static action, okay? Now, these classes of antifungal drugs are the azoles, the polyenes, the elalamines, antifungal antibiotics, antimetabolites, and echnoindins. All systemic antifungal drugs have more side effects and adverse effects than most of your antibacterial drugs. Now that's really saying something. So let's talk about how antifungal drugs work. Now the membranes are made up of polyphospholipids and ergosterols as shown in the figure in your book. So let's get into just a little bit of them, okay? Now, to reproduce and live, the fungal cells must keep their plasma membrane and their cell walls intact. Antifungal antibiotics work by inhibiting the formation of the spindle fibers, which stop the process of fungal cell division and reproduction. The anti-metabolites work by entering the fungal cells and acting as a counterfeit DNA base. It prevents fungal protein needed for reproduction and growth from being made. Ergosterol is a fat lipid. It's similar to like cholesterol that is part of the human cell plasma membrane. Also, echo can candidates stop fungal production of glycan. So the uh, motor is very thin and very weak and then this makes the entire fungal cell wall very weak and unable to protect the fungal cell. Then we have the azoles, the polyenes, the alamides. Uh, these either prevent the fungus from making uh, ergosterol to bind to the ergosterol and prevent it from being properly placed in the fungal membrane. The fungal membranes are leaky and then allow damage to 
the fungus at all to decrease it from occurring. Please make uh, sure that you guys are referring to um, the table in your book that's labeled, Does the Common Antifungal Drug or Doses for Common Antifungal Drugs? Now, what are our intended responses and side effects and adverse effects of these medications? So, what we want to happen is that we want to eradicate the infection. We want to have normal functioning of the tissue and organs. But then there are some side effects, y'all, that come along with that. Like changes in how food might taste, diarrhea, headache, nausea, vomiting, thinning of the hair even and some IV drugs that cause pain and redness at the site of where the IV is placed. Some adverse effects are things like anemia, liver toxicity, hypokalemia, severe rashes, abdominal um, discomfort, abnormal heart um, rhythms, um, reduce kidney function, and they also could get that Steven Johnson's syndrome. Now, antifungals have many interactions. Like the azoles, they, in higher dosages, they can cause heart dysrhythmias. And those echocondins can increase the rate of clot formation, which can make somebody get more blood clots. Now, before giving any antifungal medication, there are several things that you need to do as the nurse. You need to check their, their lab work to see if they're already anemic, to see if they already have some liver toxicity problems. You want to check the patient's current lab work, especially blood, urea, nitrogen, like their BUN, and some serum creatinine levels to see what's going on with their kidneys and if they have any kidney impairment already. You're gonna check and recheck the exact dose that you're supposed to be giving them to be administered each time you give the medication. You must do all your medication um, checks. Um, pain, so you're gonna plan the dosage schedule around their meals. Do not take this with any grapefruit juice or um, things like that. And you must limit intake to no more than 24 ounces of that type of juice a day. But don't take it with it at all. Um, also, before giving, it should not be given with any drugs that reduce gastric acids, such as a proton pump inhibitor or a histamine blocker because this drug is activated by stomach acids, all right? We're gonna test dose of um, Afrotericin B. This should be given one milligram IV over 20 to 30 minutes because of the risk of an allergic reaction. We're going to do the test dose. Usually the first dose of Amphotericin B is much smaller than the daily dose, and the peritoneal dose must be used as soon as it is mixed, or it is not going to be. It's going to be unstable. And administer the drug very slowly, regardless of the dose. After giving these medications, um. First, if it's given through the IV, we're going to do um, a dose check, and then we're going to check the patient every 15 minutes after giving it for any signs of symptoms of allergic reaction. So we're going to be looking for things like hives and pain at the site or hives at the site. Uh, their blood pressure is going down. They may have some rapid or irregular pulse rates or some angioedema. Your first response is to stop any more of the drug from entering into the patient if you notice these types of problems. So you wanna stop the IV administration. 
We're going to check their skin every shift. We're going to ask the patient if they are itchy or have any skin changes and things like that. We're going to check the patient daily for any problems or signs and symptoms of liver problems. We're going to check the patient's apical pulse for about a whole minute, at least twice a day. We're going to make sure we document that and document that if we notice any changes of their heart rate and rhythm and express it to their prescriber. We're going to check the patient's laboratory values, especially their white blood cell count, their red blood cell count, and their platelets, and the blood hematocrit and hemoglobin. We want to check their BUN, their creatinine, and potassium levels every time um, they are taken. We're going to examine their, uh, their input and their output every day to determine if their urine output is within 500 mL of the total fluid that they intook. We're going to notify the prescriber if any of their blood counts are low, if any of their labs look irregular. Okay, so now with, um, if they're taking uh, terbinafine and flucal flucysticine, we're going to check the patient every shift, document it, uh, if we know any signs of any new infections. With um, echo condens, we're going to check the patient's calves and document those every day for any signs and symptoms of DVTs, D vein thrombosis. If the client is on afrotericin, B, we're going to check the patient's blood pressure at least every hour while they are on the drug or while the drug is being infused in the patient. We're going to watch for any signs and symptoms of shock and things like some hypotension or their um, O2 stat is um, less than 90%. We're going to make sure that they don't have any rapid heart rate or rapid and shallow breathing, um, or any decreased urine output or changes in their level of consciousness. If these occur, we're gonna call RRT, so that is the uh, rapid response team, right away, and we're gonna notify the prescriber. So, some expected side effects after IV uh, ampotercins, may include things like chills or fever or headaches or uh, rigorous. They may have some flushing, some hypotension, some nausea, and some vomiting. But we need to monitor and check for these things and document. Now, when we are teaching our patients about these antifungal medications, we want to warn these patients that taking these antifungal drugs to tell other healthcare providers that they are on it that they are taking them because of the such high rate of drug interaction that they could get from taking any other medication. We're going to also warn the patient to take um, that very seriously and to not even take over-the-counter drugs without consulting their physician or prescriber who has put them on the antifungal medications. We're going to remind the patients to avoid and minimize drinking grapefruit juice while taking azole. We're going to remind them to report any new irregularities, like rates faster than 100 beats per minute um, at rest, or rates slower than 50 beats per minute um, to their prescriber. We're going to also educate them to make sure they notify their prescriber if they're having any signs and symptoms of liver toxicity, like that jaundicing. Uh, we're going to teach them to check um, weekly for any increased things like paleness or fatigue or increased heart rate, shortness of breath. Your prescriber needs to know these things right away. We're also going to teach the patient by taking... Um, Terbinafine and flu, flucistoxin for more than one week to avoid crowds, just avoid people altogether who are ill because those two medications have decreased your resistance. So you are more at risk now 
to get an infection. Now some of the lifespan considerations for antifungal medications. For pediatrics, so our considerations are that these medications, the safety and effectiveness of many systemic antifungal drugs have not been established for pediatric patients. For pediatric patients, we need to use caution. Uh, terbinafine is prescribed for things like ringworm or for scalp as granules to be sprinkled or a spoonful of pudding or other soft non-acidic foods. They must swallow entire spoonful without chewing. Now, the considerations for pregnancy and lactation is that it is not recommended during pregnancy unless infection is a serious or life-threatening. And then also we know that there is a fungal medication called grisofluvin that has a very high likelihood of increasing the risk of fetal birth defects and fetal damage and should not be taken during a woman's pregnancy. For older adults, they may develop some neurologic reactions more often than the younger clients. And these reactions include abnormal thinking. They could have some anxiety, some agitation, and they also may have some cerebral vascular, vascular accidents. They could have a stroke, um, coma, confusion, some depression, blurred vision, dizziness, increased drowsiness, even hallucinations, hearing loss, and peripheral neuropathy with the older adults. Now, if they are taking these echo incontinence, they are at a greater risk for some DBTs, and they want to be taught to use DBT prevention strategies. Um, so they should assess for daily swelling, pain, tenderness of their lower legs, and then also to notify the prescriber right away and then we will document these findings, okay?